know, it is great. It is great to have a great boss. And uh, thank you very much, Al, for your generosity all the time. I'd like us to just look very briefly this morning uh, what SDAA means. Many of you know what SDA means, but not with an extra A with it. So SDAA is what we are going to talk about this morning. My name is Steve Okello. I am the treasurer for the SDAA and also associate treasurer for the British Union Conference and of course also treasurer for another company called Seventh Day Adventist Trust Company, which we will not talk about today. Um, I'd just like us to find out, out of a group of us here, how many of you know what SDAA means? I just want to see. Every time I speak, I see a growing number of hands. Okay, let's just see how many of you do not know what SDAA means. Maybe an equally large number, just about 50-50%. Now, I, before I came to work here at the union, I, I didn't know what SDAA means either. So you are very normal if you don't know what SDAA means. SDAA really means Seventh Day Adventist Association Limited. It is uh, a company that is uh, sitting at the British Union Conference in Stanborough Park. Um, it is an organization that is the Seventh-day Adventist Association of Churches. So we are an association of all churches across the Union. Um, <clears throat> let's just find out what we do. <laughs> A blank space there. As I said, the Seventh Day Adventist Trust, uh, Seventh Day Adventist Association stands for Seventh Day Adventist Association Limited, and uh, we are actually the legal arm of the church. We do everything legal, things to, to do with uh, owning the titles of the property. So we buy the buildings on behalf of the local churches. Also, we sell buildings uh, on behalf of the local churches and also the conferences. So we are uh, dealing largely with solicitors and everything that is legal about the church. As I said, we also have all the titles of the properties and also the titles of the land that belongs to all the churches, and also all uh, the conferences that we have. So the church that you attend, if it belongs to this, the church, we have the title. We buy it. It is in the name of the Seventh-day Adventist uh, Association Limited. <coughs> we also um, are the organization that goes to court if things go wrong. In the unlikely event that things go wrong, it is the Seventh-day Adventist Association that is taken to court rather than a local church. And the purpose for that is to shield the local churches from going into court and being dragged into court so that the local church can uh, get on with their uh, primary work and we go to court on their behalf. Uh, sometimes back now, I remember we were taken to court or whether we, we took somebody to court because they could not be able to leave our building. So we had to serve them an eviction notice and to leave our building and we had to be taken to court for that. So largely we are the, um, the legal arm of the church. Now, have you ever thought about who owns your church? Many of us just go to church and we don't know how is it owned. <laughs> Anybody going to give us a, an idea who owns the church? I know many of you do a lot of uh, fundraising to make the church and 
put the money together, but who really, really owns it? There's an, a hand at the back. I'm hearing mamas. There's a, a lady brave at the back. The conference. Okay, that's a good try. Anybody else? I hear a lot of answers. There's, there's one there. The members. Somebody says the members. Okay. Uh, uh, good try, but uh, we are not there yet. Who, who else want to try? Daniel says it's him. Uh, not quite. Uh, who else? It is the SDAA who owns the churches. You buy the church... But then SDAA, we own it. <laughs> now let me complete my statement. We own it on your own behalf, okay? <laughs> That's why we don't have keys to your church. You have them. Uh, so we just hold it for you. But why do we do that? Why is it that it is not possible? The, the local church don't... Um, own the titles to the property. They don't have it in their own name. Uh, so if it is a Croydon church, it is not owned in the name of Croydon church. There's a lady here. Because people come and the people go. So if somebody came in and it was in their name and they went, they would go with the church. Yes? And we don't want a system like that. We want a system which can uh, provide a place for worship for, for members throughout. Now, there was a story I heard where one church, one church group um, nominated a very faithful elder um, at the time to own or put his name on the church uh, title. And then, of course, you know, things were going well and uh, the church was flourishing. But as you know, uh, sometimes people have conflict and he said, I am tired of this conflict, I'm going to leave and go my way and I'm actually going to take the church building with me. <laughs> and uh, he asked the police to make sure that nobody comes to church the following week and the police said it belongs to him, not to the members. So that's one of the reasons why we keep the churches under um, SDAA because SDAA uh, will always be there. They would not go anywhere. They are a legal organization. They are a company um, and they are able to um, keep the church ownership under the title so that members can be able to use the church continuously. As I had said earlier, all the legal titles to all the properties belongs to the, um, to the Seventh-day Adventist Association limited. But the beneficial owners are the local church members uh, grouped under the conference. So the, for those who are from the South England conference, it would be, all the properties would be um, for members of the local churches in, in the South England conference, but under the, the, the beneficial owners are with the, 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 the SEC and similar to the one in the north as well, and the missions. We are based at Stanborough Park, uh, where the British Union uh, um, offices are based. That's where we are sitting. Uh, um, both of the um, SEC, NEC are charities, and also the Seventh-day Adventist organization is a limited company uh, registered with Company House, and also, it is also a charity. So it's both a limited company and also a charity for many other technical reasons for that. Now, many of you might own a property already. Some of you might not own a property. I was just speaking to some of uh, our members here from uh, Redditch Church, and they described themselves as not having a home, and they're moving from one place to the next, like the children of Israel, and hopefully someday they hope to be in Canaan, where they would have bought a property of their own and have their own. So, can I just see a show of hands, those of you who have properties of your own? 
quite a number, quite a number. Okay, those of you who do not have a property of your own, and you are hoping one day to have one, that's right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right, okay. So this part of the presentation will largely look at um, those people who do not have a property of their own just yet. And I'll just go through very quickly and also give a chance to those who own a property uh, towards the end. So just bear with us for those of you who own a property. Let's uh, just see how is it that you can be able to have a property of your own. This is the process. You need to make a case. Make a case for, um, for, 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 for owning a property. So for those of you from Redditch, I think you'll be very, uh, you'll be able to benefit from this. The congregation go through a process of completing a pros and cons exercise and a cost benefit study. And um, you need to look at the pros for buying or for, 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 for building your own and the, the con cons for, for, for not buying and also not, not uh, um, not, not building. So the process is, this exercise is essentially non-financial. Uh, in nature, it asks such questions as, for example, is the present sanctuary big enough uh, to house the congregation or present an, or, 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 the, the present or anticipated membership? So you need to ask questions like, like that. Can we be able to um, um, hold more of our members. I was visiting a church in North, North England and their church is full. They don't have a place to, to house uh, the Sabbath school for children. It's constantly full. People are standing on the side and uh, it, they, they, they are thinking of moving to another building. Does it have sufficient rooms other than children rooms or Sabbath school classes and uh, if you have, you know, the service of humility, would you have a place to buy, to, to, to have that? So if you are thinking of buying or you are thinking of building, think about things like these before you, you start looking for a property. But think about, can it hold your current uh, membership? Can it hold also, uh, if your church were to grow, can it be able to hold more members? Would it have other rooms within this building that you're looking at uh, to be able to hold a Sabbath school and other services that you might have and so on? Do you hope to have a kitchen, for example, or for general halls and vestries, pastor's vestries and, uh, and pastor's offices? Think about things like those if you're going to buy or build a property. Is the location generally accessible? Can you be able to access it easily uh, by members? Can they easily get there by train or bus? Or, or can they be able to get in there without any challenges? Is the location and building representative? Does it represent the ethos of the Seventh-day Adventist? Uh, look at that building and, and think carefully if it is representative of the faith that we profess. Does it have adequate parking? Now, this is always a difficult one. Sometimes you can find a very beautiful building, but there is no what? No parking for members. So they are struggling to, to find a parking place. Uh, of course, most people drive to church. Is the fabric of the property sound? Look at the fabrics of the property. Does it, is it very sound? Is it good? Where, where the answer to any of the above is not good enough or unsatisfactory, could they best be rem remedied in another different way? Now, recently we, we bought a church in Liverpool, and uh, the church was beautiful, a Jehovah's Witness, uh, former Jehovah's Witness uh, Kingdom Hall, and uh, it didn't have a parking. <coughs> they could afford it, it was beautiful, but the thing they didn't have was a parking. So we had to find a different place for them to park. There was just a solicitor's, uh, a farm of solicitors, just not too far from them, about five, ten minutes walk, uh, who agreed to uh, offer 
their parking over the Sabbath so that the members can park there and walk to church. So find some other place where they can be able to park if you cannot find one immediately next to your church. Can you be able to develop the current or the present site or do you have to move to a new site? Think about things like that. Is moving to a new site, if moving to a new site, what disadvantages uh, this is likely to give or, or to give? So think about things along those lines. Now the cost benefit study also just builds, as far as is reasonable, uh, place a price on some of those uh, issues that you have raised. Put a price tag on each one of them, um, whether you are buying or you are uh, or you're building. Use ac use reasonable, accurate estimates from appropriate professional uh, professionals, and and ask questions uh, around it. How much would it cost to develop the present site, for example, by adding new facilities? Think about things like that. How about just remodeling the present building? Can you just do something with the current building you have and remodel it differently? Think about what is the sale value of the present building. Get proper estimates and valuations of your building before you think about going to the next uh, building. We just did one in London where they are hoping to go to move to a bigger place and uh, they want to sell their current property. So they had to get proper valuations to find out how much it cost, uh, how much it would uh, sell uh, their current property so that they can use the money they get from that site to buy the next. So think about things like that. What would it cost to buy or build a new facility? It's all about the cost and putting price about on, on, this, on this. This is still happening at the local church. It hasn't hit the conferences yet. It hasn't gone to the missions yet. It is still just at the local church. This is something that is happening at the local church. How about fitting out the new building if you bought? Things like baptistry, about kitchens, <coughs> and about the pews, and etc., etc. Think about things like that. On occasions, the church may require loans. If it might be need loans, could the congregation service that loan repayment? Those are things that you have to ask ahead of time. How financially viable in each of the proportion, each of the options you come across, you need to think about all those. This is a study that is still held at the local church. Would a conference or mission be granted, work with the local um, conference treasurer. Speak to them ahead of time and find out could you be able as a church get a grant from them as part of your financial uh, planning. If so, how much can they be able to grant? There are different levels of grants that they can be able to offer on occasion. It's a limited amount, uh, so start early if you're thinking. Start speaking to the conferences uh, much, much earlier. And completion of this exercise should assist the congregation in identifying the most suitable option. If not already the case, the conference, the mission administration should be promptly engaged at this point to work with the church with a view to moving the process forward to realization. So if you are happy that you've done all this through, this is a time that you can be able to uh, uh, start talking to the conference. Now, one of the vital documents we will want to see at the <coughs> conferences is uh, the financial plan. Vital to any building project is a financial plan, depending on the type of project involved. Either you're doing a, se a buying or a selling or you are uh, remodeling, it will be very important to put in a proper financial plan for this. <coughs> Think about your income. Do you have cash in hand? <coughs> can you, if you have your own property at the moment, can you be able to sell it? Is it, 
capable of being sold. There is one property we have in the north, I won't say which name, but they have really struggled to sell the current property that they have. Uh, so they cannot be able to release the funds from there. So think about, can your property be able to be sold and how quickly can, can that happen? You might need a mortgage. Uh, so think about how much of, of the loan can you be able to get. Think about also denominational loans. The South England Conference or the North England Conference may consider to give the local church a loan. And also the BUC may also be access, may, may be able to access a limited amount of loan as well from there. So think about this as a sources of income for your project. Uh, you can be able to get a grant. And then think about the expense. What is it that you're going to be um, uh, paying out? The purchase price is one of the biggest costs on the new property. Uh, if you have to buy the land, think about the cost of the land. There would be also associated new works that has to be, uh, um, will be done. We are doing a property in, in the north as well at the moment where they find that they had to do refurbishment and do some associated work in order for them to be able to occupy. You might buy a building and it's not quite just ready for uh, occupation. So you need to think about how much would it cost us to bring it to a point where we can be able to come in. Get proper realistic estimates. If you don't get realistic estimates, uh, you may start and then you end up finding you don't have enough money to complete. So get proper uh, uh, estimates. There will also be legal fees involved in this. If you are buying, there would be costs that the solicitors uh, would, uh, would, would uh, we would have to pay the solicitors. So there are fees that you have to consider as part of the expenditures. Estate agents, also may be involved and they have their fees and it is important to consider this architect fees, uh, commissioning costs, lots of costs that are involved in the process. So think very carefully. Think also about the cash flow going forward. Uh, it's very important to think about can you be able to afford the loans over the years. Uh, for the BUC loans, I know it is over seven years. Uh, other, other loans may be over 10 years. So think about that far ahead in your projections. The, pl the financial plan should demonstrate that from the outset, the local congregation has sufficient funds to complete the project, including the cost of putting any newly acquired building into sufficiently usable state. And so that's the process that we have. I just want you to know that there is a process involved if you're thinking about uh, acquiring a property. I think we've talked about furnitures and things like that and where, pu where purchase is being delayed, there are associated costs along those lines. The financial plan should exclude padding. Typically seen in these areas are pledges and fundraising. Now, Often our members are very faithful and they pledge and often they, um, they, they, they come through with their pledges. But we tend not to um, put that in because we cannot be able to enforce a pledge. So this, this part is usually excluded from our, our financial plan because we cannot be able to enforce it. Denominational policy requires that before approving a project, 75% of the total cost of the project inclusive of commission cost is in hand or in the form of readily converted assets. So that's what we require. Think about that so that you have 75 of the total cost of the project are, are all in hand. Satisfactory arrangements, e.g. approved mortgages, you need to approve this ahead of time exist to cover the remaining 25%. So think about these things ahead of time before uh, you engage um, in buying. 
initial approaches are exploratory only, just make some exploratory. It's, it's good to talk about these things ahead of time, uh, but um, only come when, it is, when you have done some exhaustive work so that it makes the whole process go quickly. <laughs> Legally binding agreements may not only be made on behalf of the conference and mission uh, by the Seventh-day Adventist Association, and where appropriate via denomination or solicitor. So for example, you might be able to, you might be looking to get some funding from other sources. Usually some of the contracts that are made with those uh, funders needs to be uh, through SDAA. So you might get some funding maybe from the local authority or from some other source, and the arrangement should be through the, S the SDAA. This includes a great arrangement with fund-making organizations such as local authorities. Uh, just think about things like that. Valuation of the charge property. Valuation of the property for purchase should be made by professional, competent uh, person in valuing the type of building in question. Now, it's important to do this through professional people. Just don't get anyone who may be <laughs> familiar to you Find somebody who is professional because they give more realistic uh, uh, valuations. We normally require two valuations, uh, and where the valuations are too wide, maybe we might need a third one. Should uh, we might need a third a third valuation? Once you finish the pros and cons and exercise benefit. Uh, and, and, and the cost-benefit study have their con co conclusions considered and uh, approved by the congregations in the business meeting. This is important. If you're going to buy or sell, the approval should come from the local church first. And it's not going to be the church board, but it is going to be the church in business meeting. It's very important because you want to carry the whole church with you, and if they approve it, then you have a good chance of being successful. Then the next uh, level is to inform the conferences uh, or the mission of the project's approved approval by the congregation. So for us at the SDAA, we'd want to see the minutes, extract of minutes from the uh, business meeting to show that the church has approved this, and the conferences will also would want to see that uh, before we can go ahead and have discussion around it. Share with the with its administra uh, this would be shared with uh, the administration either in the North or the South England conference, also at the conference at the, at the, at the mission level. So this would be shared. Um, you need to also involve the conferences and SDAA to visit the site ahead of time. Sometimes they might see something that the local church may have not seen. So uh, invite them to come in and have a look at your project uh, to see what potential it has. They might be able to offer uh, advice and directions at that point. It is necessary to our planning permission for change of use, some of the buildings might need change of use, so it's important to get the proper planning permission. You might need proper building regulations, uh, especially if you're doing an extension. Remember, there may be building regulation requirements. Um, mortgage facilities, and as we had talked about, non-denominational grant agreements may need to be in place and even the denominational grants, and so forth, and so forth. Get structural surveys where necessary. Sometimes, if you look at the building, they might be maybe a bit old and might have structural issues that you cannot maybe see physically with, with your eyes, but people who are specialized in this area can be able to, um, to see those clearly for you. So once you prepare the financial plan, also on the cash flow, submit this along with all the relevant drawings and quotation and agreements to the conference and the executive 
uh, committee will go through the approval process to uh, get this to you. At this point, the conference committee, uh, working with, with and through the administration, will approve the project, referring it to the BUC if it is of a certain size, uh, or even to the TED, uh, where appropriate, depending on the size, we escalate it and higher and higher, depending on the size of the work. And then instruct the Seventh Day <coughs> Adventist Association to proceed to completion. And then, of course, we would have to arrange payments or purchase uh, of the price and the cost. Work with the local church. We will be working with the local church once it gets to SDAA. And uh, we'll work also with the architects to ensure that this process is complete. SDA will also sit down and uh, consider this uh, project, look into the project proposal with a view to ensuring that due diligence has been done at the church and also at the conference level. And their decision is either at the SDAA to approve it or sometimes gently refer it back to the conference for further information. Once the project has been approved by, then the SDAA secretary has to instruct the solicitors to take it through the conveyancing all to completion. Solicitors will be involved. Once the solicitors also get hold of the process, then they will conduct further searches. Make sure that, you know, there is no road that is planned to go through your building or that there is no um, things underground, environmental issues. Make sure that we have a proper title, that the person from which we are buying the property is the correct person and that we are getting good titles from this building. Now, this point sometimes takes a little longer depending on the, uh, the, pro, the, the, the church uh, that we are buying, but we always request that uh, time should be given to solicitors to work through this. If you rush this, this, this section, you might not get a proper, uh, um, a proper, a proper uh, title and a proper process. So that's important. So those, that's, that's just the process for all the, um, those people who are seeking to buy. Now this section, you'll not see it on your notes, um, but I just put this for the benefit of those people who have a building of their own. The licenses. I just wanted to talk about the licenses. Who needs a license? Now, many of our church buildings, uh, we, we, we often, uh, we, one of the biggest expenditures that we have is our church building. Yes? This is where we spend a lot of money. Some churches are now in the south, nothing less than 800,000 pounds. And uh, we encourage that the local church use their building. The value of the building is in their use. If you don't use it, think about it. If you bought a building for 800000 and use it for Sabbath morning and uh, maybe in the afternoon with the AYS, AY program, and then close it for the next Sabbath. And then do that every week, every month. Is that a good use of 800,000 pounds? No. It is in the use. How well do you use this building? Uh, some churches have been very successful at this. For example, a church like Stanbridge Church has a lot of use in their building. You hardly go in there and find that there is nothing. So there's something always going there, either training or pathfinders or uh, a, a club of some kind is going inside the building because they have worked out a system where they, they, they can be able to have things going on there throughout the time. That's what we need to use a better use of the property. But having other people coming to use your property also have some other legal challenges. Some of our churches have uh, maybe another church, maybe another Sunday church coming to use our building. And what we always advise is that you have a proper license. A license is a document or an agreement that gives the other person a right to use your own uh, building 
or space. So you need a license. So if you have a church, and most treasurers uh, usually have uh, opportunity to be in some of these meetings where decisions are being made, and if you s hear of something like, you know, can we ask somebody to use our car park, for example, and uh, ask the question, do you have a license? Uh, I think in last, 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 uh, Graham Barham, Barham made this point. He said, make sure that you have a license for uh, your church if somebody is using it. Why do why churches need a license? Why is it that we need a license? Now, I think it's some years ago, there is one uh, group of nursery school uh, was using our church building. We were quite happy with it, but there was no license in place. And uh, when it came time to sell the property, the nursery school said, well, we don't have a place to move to, and therefore we will not move out. And so the person who wanted to buy from us said, could you get the nursery out? <laughs> and the nursery said, no, we can't move out because we have special rights, legal rights. We cannot move out. Uh, and we had to spend a lot of money, legal fees, to be able to ask them. It took us almost three years or four years to move them out. <coughs> There's another church in the North England Conference somewhere where we have not been successful in moving another group uh, that are using our churches there to, um, to, to move out. We tried to sell, but uh, they said they're not moving out because now they have gained special rights within the building. And they did not have a properly, uh, proper contract in that building. That's why we insist that we only have licenses, but that license must only be for one year only. We can renew it, but uh, after a year, but after, after, after the church board or the church has given their permission to renew it. So we want to see every, every, every year that the church board goes through this process, make sure that they approve if they want the next, uh, to give the permission for the next, uh, uh, the next year because we know that every year you make a decision with your plans to move to, um, to, to either use the building in a different way, and we want to give you that opportunity to be able to, to make that choice. So if you own a property um, of your own, think about who uses that property. And if you have a license, who is the license with? Make sure you do that. Also, if you do not have a property, and you are using another church, uh, usually they would also ask you to have a proper license in place. Make sure that SDAA signs it. If you sign it yourself, then what would happen is that if something goes wrong, it would not be the church. It would be you personally, and you don't want that to happen to you. So make sure that it is done properly. The SDA is available to work on on, on, on our licenses. Natalie, my secretary here, is always working every month to make sure that we have proper insurances and that they're renewed on time so that at least we do not have uh, the, the awkward uh, situation where somebody doesn't move out of our building and, um, and, and that there would be legal cost. I think that's where I'd like to end it this morning and maybe just give questions <coughs> And maybe, hopefully, we'll just get some answers. Very excited aunt here. <laughs> uh, I know the number seven is very important for the Adventist church. Yeah. Also the number 12. Mm -hmm. And I know this seven years for the Lord can be a bit burdensome. Why can't they not be 10 years, 12 years? Because the, the, the bank will give 10 years. Why is it so difficult to make it a 12-year mortgage that will make it easier for the churches to stretch out the payments, make okay. it a bit easier? And okay. secondly, yeah. we just bought our church. 
and we found the process very hard. Mm. And the difficult part wasn't with the seller, wasn't with the lawyers, it was with the SDA. I'm sorry, it is the truth. <laughs> it, it's too slow. Yeah. I could have bought a house, sold it, bought another house, sold it, and bought another house, okay. and to buy a church. It takes too long. Okay. And it caused damage to our church. Because when we, when we agreed, settled on the price, by the time we access the building, it's going to cost us thousands of pounds more. Okay. It's not fair. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've just heard you buying and selling and buying and selling all these properties. Maybe we should be coming to you for a loan. <laughs> what turn to you? Um, with, with, on the loans question, um, the BUC gives out a loan from what's called a BUC revolving fund. We have a fund that's um, continually um, replenished by the repayment of the loans. The fund is uh, half a million pounds. So on average, loans can be a maximum of uh, 50,000 um, pounds. So that, in effect, means we can only give at any given time 10 loans. So it's, 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 it's set at seven years so that it can be repaid back in a reasonable amount of time so that the loan can be accessed by other churches when they, when they, when they ha have a need. Um, does that, does that answer uh, that? that uh, yeah. To, to facilitate other, to, to make it easier for other, um, smaller churches yeah. I mean, to repay the money I mean, and, a, and, and increase the fund over time. I mean, it, it has, uh, actually, in saying that, it has been increased to 700, 700,000. Yeah, John was going to correct me then, wasn't you? Uh, it has been, because of the need, uh, it's been stretched out to 700,000 pounds now, but still, um, you're looking at a, a, a limited number of churches that can benefit from it from it at any given moment in time. So it's there to ensure that it's paid in a reasonable amount of time so we can help more and more churches. If, church, if churches need, need further um, uh, debt capacity, then they, then they can go out to, uh, in your case, NatWest or the South Island Conference, they can additionally access loans from, the, uh, from HSBC or, in the SEC's case, SEC also give out loans as well. But the North Indian Conference is in quite in a financial position to extend loans at this time. So external banks can also be accessed for loans. As with the process, do you, do you want to take that question? Or? Yeah. Yeah. As for the process, the process usually is um, usually at the solicitor's point of view. That's where the, we take a lot of time because they have to do proper due diligence to be able to get this uh, process through. And that's partly one of, the longest, one of the longest parts that we have to take. And if we do not do that properly, we might not be able to get good title. But we are open to improvement. We are open to improvement. There's another hand here. This is possibly a cheeky question. Mm -hmm. um, as you've said, we've got you've, you've got that account which is sort of what feeds the, the loans that go out to, to the individual churches. Yeah. Um, can I ask, is that sort of generally always being used to its sort of fullest extent? Or I'm just sort of curious because we, we are revving up to the point of trying to buy our own church and doing all the fundraising and all that sort of yeah. thing. And I'm just curious on two accounts. Um, Number one is, you know, are we going to reach a point where we're like, yes, we've got the money now, we're ready to come to you, and you go, oh, and shucks, no, the last one's just gone, you're going to have to wait seven years. Or is there a case of, like, where it's not being used to the fullest extent, and is there any chance of, like, you know, obviously if you've got, say, three spaces available and nobody else is looking, can we be cheeky and take more? So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we're referring to, to the loans, yes? We're referring to loans. Yeah, I mean... It, it, Initially, yes, we had reached our maximum. It was, it was uh, fully utilised, the 500000 pounds. So about a year ago, John, I think we uh, we took the decision on the. Uh, we looked at our finances and we felt that we could increase the fund by another couple hundred thousand pounds, I think, uh, to to seven hundred thousand um, pounds. And that that probably probably is about something around about six six maybe six weeks. So there's probably capacity for maybe one. Cause, see, on an ongoing basis. Um, there are there are churches coming on stream, you know. I, I don't probably every quarter, Steve. There's yeah. probably a church acquisition 
going through on, on average uh, throughout, uh, throughout the years. Yeah. I mean, I, when I was in the South, I mean, it was bewildering. We were buying properties, you know, almost, almost every, every month, it seems, some, uh, sometimes. Or, but it's, not just, it's just not buying properties. Sometimes churches get involved in major refurbishment properties. I'm talking about multi, uh, multi-million multi pound refurbishment yeah. properties. Or in the recent case, I mean, Chiswick was about, about a million pound just, yeah. just to re, re, uh, that was a complete rebuild. So we've, it's set at 50,000 so that we can be fair and equitable, to, equitable and helpful to as many churches as possible. But as I said, um, if they, once, you, once the, the 50,000 has been accessed from it, if you need more, you can also you can always go uh, through your conference. Um, uh, applica- approaches could be made for NatWest, in your case, or uh, HSBC loans as well. Okay, there's uh, another hand here. Yes. Um, our church actually rent on a yearly basis. You are renting? Yeah. Okay. Who should sign the agreement for that yearly contract? You're renting from another organization, yes. is that right? Yes, from it the school. It should be SDAA who signs that on your so behalf. So when we get the document, rent, we should send it to who? Send it to me, and then I will... Where are you based? We are based at Stanbra Park. Okay. Stanbra Park, just at the same office of BUC. Thank you. Yeah. Because I, I wasn't told that before. Yes. Just. Uh, no, m- not many people know that if you are renting from another organisation, which is not our church, you can always uh, send the licences that have been offered to you for us to sign, so that uh, you have a proper um, uh, system in place. I mean, if you understand, and the reason for that is, um, if there's some legal problems that that occur, you you don't want to go to the, to court. He, 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 he. No, uh, well, yeah. SDA, if, if you do SDA it yourself, said, if, you, if you sign it, you take on personal liability for yes. that contract. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way, if you, if you sign a contract for, for a purchase or, or a building project, whatever, if you sign it personally, um, you take on personal liability. When I say you, sometimes we found uh, the treasurer feels that they're the ones who should sign the contract, or the elder, uh, or the pastor. No. The legal entity is Steve. He's he's um, SDAA is a legal entity of the church in this country. Um, uh, he he's um, empowered to sign contracts on your behalf yeah. uh, to avoid uh, those eventualities. That's right. That's right. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my question is: Where does the conference stand on renting our churches? to other denomination. The, re- the reason I ask that is that we're renting our church out, and there's a there's mem- certain member who objected to it, yeah. and I think he, he even caught Ellen White. So he should be letting us. So where does the conference stand on we renting our church out to, do- to other denomination? You, you, if, I, if I can say that one. You know, at any given moment in time, well, let me, let, me, let me see a show of hands of all the churches there that, here that are renting a property on the Sabbath morning. Are, are, are you renting from a Seventh-day Adventist church? <laughs> Do I need to say any more? You know, I, you know for, 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 my, for my point of view, it makes, you know, on a Sabbath morning, if you're not using it, it makes good financial sense because you're, you're generating income for your local congregation. To help you for your operating costs, uh, to help you with your own evangelism projects, etc. Uh, unless, unless there's some part, uh, minister in, in the in the room that's going to stand up and uh, say yes. otherwise, I would say go for it. No. <laughs> many many other many other denominations have really helped us out. Uh, every time we are looking for a place to worship, and uh, immediately we get our own building. We. <laughs> We would not want other people to use. So it's, it's, it's something that, I don't know, it's probably more theological issue, but uh, from a common, common sense, we really need to help other people too. There's another hand. Oh, there's, there's a hand here. Michael, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to that now. Yeah. We're talking about rental agreements, and I know we looked at it from a properties perspective. Yes, rent agreements. Yeah, rent agreements from a properties perspective. But what if we're renting equipment? Renting equipment yes. to somebody else. Somebody no, somebody else's. We're actually renting from another company, another firm. 
Okay. Who signs those? Um, <laughs> I hope that there are not many. Now, number one. <laughs> but uh, I think that is more insurance issue. Is that right? So, 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 so you're, you're, you're renting, you're, 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 you're renting equipment for, from Sabbath to Sabbath. Like a photocopier yeah. type of yeah. thing. Yeah. I, th I think if it is that long, yeah. it is best to bring it to SDAA. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. And make sure that we have proper licenses, we have proper agreement on, around it. If it was a short term and a small amount, then it's not so risky. But if it is five years and it's probably large, it's maybe a good idea to have it signed. Can I ask what, what equipment is? Yeah. Can I just suggest, I mean, I mean, the days of leasing, because you know, photocopies are very, very cheap these days. <laughs> but, but you can buy, you can buy the photocopier, you can buy the photocopier, you can still take out maintenance contracts on it. Okay. Okay. Right. All right. Let, let me take the, 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 the there's a lady at the back. I'm, I'm told that it's only two more I can accept. We've got and a question and answer section at the, at the end, so just two more quick questions. Could we do let, have to let um, okay. Marcus up? Um, okay, so my question, it is loosely under property, so if you want to um, kind of bank it to later, it's fine, but um, my question is that within my area, I'd say within a three-mile radius, there's about five churches renting, uh, approximately 1,500 a, a month uh, with prayer meeting, etc., and so when you look at that on an annual basis, that's 90,000 going out from offering every year. Mm. Uh, and we're the youngest of those churches at 10 years. Is there not something that can be done by way of scheme or, you know, I know obviously I can't compare ourselves to the government, but the government has the help to buy or whatnot to possibly group these churches because to me it seems like a gross misuse of God's money. I've heard that discussions before whether we can be able to group churches together so that they can buy maybe one, one church together. And I've seen it, one, two congregations joined up before and were able to buy their own. Uh, but that's a wider discussion, and I think it's a welcome one. If we, if we can be able to group churches together within a reasonable uh, area, then we can be able to do that. But just as a, a much wider discussion. If we can save further questions now for, for, for the end now, because we didn't... Yeah, yeah. One last, one last question. My, mine is quite um, a simple, straightforward, but I need some clarification. In terms of reporting... I understand the SDAA are the legal owners of the properties. Yes. So when it comes to the balance sheet, because there are times when we, well, there was a time that we had to apply for a grant. A grant. Yes. yes. Yeah. So what they wanted in terms of the financial statements was a balance sheet. So I want to know if ever a local church has asked for a balance sheet, are we allowed to include the property as part of our fixed assets or do we leave that out? Yeah, so, so the, the, though, though we own the title of the property, the value and the recording or the financial recording of these properties are in the conferences. So for those properties in the north, there would be uh, uh, in the North England conference with uh, Elder Charles and the south with Elder Sean, for those of you there. But you can talk to them to be able to give you some valuation of uh, what, what value is your property for example, to include in your application. Yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. Property is, is always a, um, an interesting discussion when we, uh, in, in our churches.